In this clip, I'm going to talk about how you design or write gap fill questions. So it's a follow on clip from an earlier one, which demonstrated five questions and the variations you have with the gap fill question type. So the first question here, as I said, is a standard gap fill question where the user enters the answers in the text boxes. The user types in the values, the answers. So to look behind the scenes, I'm going to edit the question. And when I go into edit the question, what you'll notice is that uh, in the main body of the question here, I have the gross profit equals and then inside square brackets, I have sales minus and then more square brackets cost of sales. So the various options and the various values you want to hide, the answers you want to hide, you simply enclose them in square brackets. So for the five questions, that's all I've done here. So this is the standard gap fill, as I said. Now what I've done is I have distractors down here in the bottom. Um, but because it's a regular gap fill where you type in the, van the answers, the uh, distractors have no bearing or have no role in the question. So they've been ignored really. Okay. The other thing that might be useful to be aware of is that uh, what I typically do is I will re record or uh, document all of my questions in say documents in Microsoft Word. So I might have all of this stuff including the square brackets and the like in a Microsoft Word document. And then I want to create my gap fill question. So when I do that, I could copy directly across from Word and paste into the, the question here. But often there's formatting that's in the Word document that will in some way distort what you see when you um, want to, when you run the question or when you trial the question. So my habit is that I take the contents of my Word document or the questions I need and I paste them into a notepad file and therefore I remove all the any hidden formatting or any other details that might be in the Word document. They disappear when I store the uh, the question details in a notepad file. So then when I copy and paste copy from the notepad file and paste into the, um, the, the question slot here, I can then use the say the bold feature to for to bold the first line or do whatever else I need to format the question in whatever way I prefer. So that's the kind of the layout of the question. Then the other uh, area you'll touch upon quite a lot when you're designing a gap fill question is this uh, choice here, more options. So under more options, you have the freedom to do a few things. One of them is to show whatever characters you want to use for the gaps. So the standard gaps are these square brackets, but if you don't, if if for some reason the square brackets play a very important role in what you're doing, then you can substitute them with these other alternatives. There's three more alternatives there you can use. So that's when most cases you obviously will use the square brackets, but there might be the odd case depending on the discipline or the subject where you need to choose something else. The question uh, presentation here I have is, is gap fill. I have two more choices called drag and drop and drop down. I rarely use the drop down because it doesn't really give me any extra value, but I do use the drag and drop quite a lot, as you'll see in other questions. So this is a gap fill question where, and what gap fill means is a gap appears and the uh, person answering the question needs to type in the answer. The other choices you have here is you can have a fixed gap size. You can have all the gaps the same size. And that could be very important uh, where the, you're using the drag and drop approach because the if the size of the gap will in some way reflect the uh, the value of the, the, the word or term you're putting into it. So if, you, if they're all the same size, there's no extra kind of clues there. If it's a, a drag and drop version, you can have the options. You can the various choices to appear after the text. They appear, they appear before the text by default, but they can appear after the text if you wish. And then the other options you might be need to be aware of are here under show more. Uh, disable regex is something you might need to do if there's lots of brackets in your work, regular brackets for calculations. No duplicates might be important. And in some cases, the the values that the user needs to enter needs to be in a, either an uppercase or lowercase or in a, a mixed case. So if that was the case, you would tick that box. But in this instance, a regular gap fill question is sufficient for me. So then when, I, when I'm finished writing the question, what I usually do is I go for a preview. I won't do it in this one because I have nothing to really to gain from it. I'll do it in one of the later questions. So then I just typically, if I want to do some more work, I'll save changes, continue editing, or if I'm finished the question, I'll just save the changes. 
So hopefully when my changes are saved, I'll be brought back to my list of questions. I'll skip the drag and drop vari variation of that question. It's just that the drag and drop variation has been entered. I think my third question here is one of my accounting questions. And the uh, aspects of this question I'm going to directly focus on straight away are the fact that the values that the user enters might be 40,000 with no decimal places, alternatively could have decimal places and have the two zeros after it, and perhaps could also have the comma after the four zero. So there are the three ways, that, um, or the, the fourth one actually is where you might have a currency symbol, a euro symbol or a dollar symbol appearing here in front of the 40. So when I'm designing that question, I won't save my changes, I'm just going back into the, to edit the question. When I'm designing that question, what I need to do is, down here at the answers, you can see the open square bracket here at the beginning and the closed square bracket at the end. But in between, what you'll notice is that I have a, a, a whole range of choices, each separated by a, a character called the pipe. And on your keyboard, the pipe is usually located just to the left of the Z key. Okay? Here's before Z and you get it by using by pressing shift and the that character. Okay, so what I have here is I either have 40,000, 40,000 with decimal points in it, 40,000 as the euro um, symbol on it, 40,000 with euro symbols and decimal points, and so on. Okay, so there's a whole list of variations for that. And that's so these are all possible valid answers that the user might enter. So obviously, when you um, are writing the quiz questions, the more of those you can anticipate, the less uh, editing and backtracking you'll have to do later on. But you can add, you can add in uh, other correct answers that you might say find when a student does a quiz. The student includes a correct variation that you hadn't thought of in advance. You can go back in here and edit the question and the, uh, the answer will then reflect that. So that's the... The, um, the important aspect of that, as I said, is the, how you may enter more than one uh, correct answer, more than one correct alternative. So the pipe character is the key character there to be, to be familiar with. So that's the, um, that question done. So I'll just save that one and move on. And the next question I'm going to look at is the one which I hope has the budget in it. Okay, so here I have a question with a budget and it has two products and I'm asked to do a sales budget. So in the earlier clip I mentioned that the uh, the question text here, you can see a border around it is just simply a snip taken from an Excel spreadsheet. And down at the bottom I have a table. Okay, so when I go to edit my question I'll show you where the table came from. So when you're editing a gap fill question, you have various features here that are available to you including bolding, italics, and so on. But there's an option here which indicates that there's additional buttons available to me. And in these additional buttons, the one that I've just been mentioning here is a table. So when I was planning this question, I had to look at my um, spreadsheet and figure out how many rows and columns I needed for my table. And then I built a table with four rows and three columns in it. And the other thing I said I've, I've done inside this table then, I have my various cells or text boxes where my answers go. And again, I, I'm using my pipe character to separate 20 from 20 point note note, from 20 euros and so on. So that's how the variations are dealt with. The other thing I've done, and I'm going to preview this question in a moment, is I've used this feature here called gap settings, which I think is a relatively new feature in this question type. And in the gap settings, what I can do is I can um, put in feedback that relates to a particular gap. So if I click here on the, the gap for the uh, first option for the 40,000 units. So it says in this slot, you should regard the value generated when you multiply. That should be multiply rather than multiple. You multiply the expected sales for the basic mask 40,000 units by the selling price for the basic mask 20 euros. So when I'm finished, the important thing to do is to press the OK button here. I think otherwise this particular value won't be recorded. To press the OK button and then you've got to go down and press the save changes and continue editing. So my next plan is to try and preview this question. So after saving my changes and continuing editing, I'm going to preview the question. 
So you'll see the, the impact of that. So I'm going to put in my, say, I'll put in the correct values here, 20, 20 for 20 euros. Sorry, that should be 40,000 or other 40,000 units. The 20, I'm going to put in as 20.00. And the 800,000, I'm going to put it in, I think, with 800, comma, 000, dot 00. And I'll actually make mistakes then in the other ones. I'll just use the same answers in the 20 euros again. So hopefully my basic product, I'll have my values correct. And my luxury product, I'll have the incorrect um, answers. That's the plan at least. So to test if this question is behaving as I uh, hope it is, I'm going to submit my answers and finish. So what it tells me is that the um, I have my various correct answers here. And I obviously hadn't got my 800,000 with the comma after the th first two zeros as two of my, uh, among my list of um, alternative correct answers. I had the 800,000 plain and I had the 800,000 with the euro sign in front of it. The other bit that I want you to notice is it says the is the feedback here in red. So as well as the incorrect answer being shown with a, with a red back, background to it, then the, the two green components are the correct answers. And then the, the feedback. Okay, this feedback generated specifically for this value. Okay, so in this lot, you should see that you should record the value generated when you multiply the expected sales for the basic mask by the selling price. And similarly for the um, the luxury one, okay? So I didn't use it, I didn't put in the uh, that feedback uh, feature or feedback component into the uh, the expected sales or the expected selling price. I just put it down here for illustration purposes in the sales value. So that's a very useful feature uh, when you want to give informative feedback to students that relate to the particular um, element of the question. So again, just to point that out, what you do is the gap settings are here. So when you click on gap settings, it makes the various gaps available to you. So you can click on any one of them. As I said, there's nothing in here for luxury for the expected sales. So when I click on it, it's blank. So I could put in my feedback for correct, feedback for incorrect, and then press OK. But I'm not going to use that at the minute, so I'm just going to cancel. So that's giving you a quick look at how you set up uh, gap fill questions. So the, the main message I want to give is that in gap fill questions, I tend to do a lot of my work initially in Microsoft Word documents, but then I paste, copy and paste my Word document contents into notepad files, and that minimizes any formatting that I might accidentally bring across from Word to Moodle. So the other features that are worth looking at, obviously, are the, when you write a question, you can preview it, and that gives you a very uh, good idea as to how well the question is working, especially if you've left out any uh, key feature. So that's the end of this clip on setting up gap fill questions.